Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so, so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this discussion, this conversation. It's a fascinating book. Um, this is uh, part of the series that Waterfires uh, Art Center has been doing with symposium books, which we call the Waterfire Symposium. And uh, it's uh, organized by John Sotke, and uh, he gives the most marvelous introduction. So I'm going to introduce John, and we're going to go from there. Thank you all for being here. That was a setup. Thank you, Barnaby. <laughs> um, I'm John. I'm the events coordinator at Symposium Books in downtown Providence and one of the curators of this series. Um, our hope with the Symposium Waterfire was to create a space um, outside of the university and more at the intersection of a number of communities to talk about some of the most pressing issues that we face as our culture and society today. So this is our fourth event in our ongoing series and we are um, thrilled to welcome um, Ariella Aisha Zule in, conver in conversation with Stanley Wolaku Wanabwa. Um, this book um, is, 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 this book really is an event. Um, it asks us the question of how do we unlearn imperialism, which it also frames as how, how do we undertake the work of repairing the world? It's, it's framed by um, an invitation to imagine what would it mean to rewind and go back to the point of 1492, Columbus's voyage, and follow a different path through history. Like um, many extraordinary books, um, its central idea is a provocation that it took me a long time to absorb. And I wrestled a lot with this question about what does it mean to rewind history as a political gesture? And I eventually decided that it was asking me, what am I willing to give up? It was, it was an ethical injunction requesting that I think about what I am willing to abandon to do the work of unmaking racism, unmaking empire, unmaking capital and ecological devastation. Um, along with that, the book also gives us a first step in this process, and it's to refuse the new. And the exploration really is of all of the ways that we are entangled um, in the dynamics of capital through the obsession with the novelty of ideas, innovation in art, new literature, the production of new things, new materialities, the excesses that ensnare ego, ambition, and desire and tie us to an order that's predicated on ongoing and destructive <laughs> consumption. Um, um, Azule wrote a quite powerful and famous essay called How uh, the Right Not to Be a Collaborator. And in some way, I take this, hand, this, this book as a handbook um, that tells me that right has to be earned. Um, and these ideas are a first guide to what it would mean to earn that right. So please welcome me, or join me in welcoming um, Stanley and Ariella. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that good? Can people hear me? <laughs> yeah, OK. Excellent. That's a good start. Hi. Hi, thank you. I want to figure out how being... to be in conversation with you and also be audible on the microphone at the same time. Thank you, John, for introducing the book and us. Yeah. Uh, do you, so the, we have a very, very, well, like a two-step structure, really. Uh, Ariel is going to read uh, some passages from the book. 
And then I'm going to try to lead us through a few of um, the very many, but I would argue, kind of pressing ideas and arguments in the, in the book from the perspective of a working photographer. Um, and then we'll open up for questions and answers afterwards and see where the evening takes us. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm really excited and a little bit nervous to be here. The book just came up. Maybe not just because it was November and uh, not so many people had the opportunity to read it because it's a, quite a long book. So I'm really excited to share with you some of its ideas and to talk with Stanley, whom I feel like uh, an intellectual uh, partner to this kind of thinking. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'll start by reading uh, part of it. Stanley suggested that I'll read the first few pages of the chapter called Potential History. So I did a variation on his request. I will read the beginning of this and I will end with uh, reading um, what I call Imagine Going on Strike that is an interval between the chapters. Each and every chapter uh, is followed by uh, imagining that some people will go on strike and then throughout this piece, usually I uh, share with the readers that actually these strikes are taking place. So this work of imagination is actually fabulation about reality. So let me start. It's the fourth chapter, Potential History. Uh, history as an imperial discipline tells plausible stories. Sorry, history as an imperial discipline tells plausible stories without questioning the violence that provides its practitioners with the building blocks that render the stories uh, plausible. Worlds shredded violently into legible pieces to compose historical narratives. Potential history is not an attempt to tell the violence alone, but rather an ontoepistemic refusal to recognize as irreversible its outcomes and the categories, statuses, and forms under which it materializes. Potential history refuses to inhabit the position of the historian who arrives after the events are over, that is, after the violence was made into part of the sealed past, dissociated in time and space from where we are. Violence against people and their worlds is not history. And the work of potential history is to argue that this violence can be reversed, brought to a closure, mended. Potential history is the attempt to make impossible the transmutation of this violence into history. Potential history is a commitment to attend to the potentialities that the institutional forms of imperial violence, borders, nation states, museums, archives, and laws, try to make obsolete or turn into uh, precious ruins. Potential history is a commitment to keep alive a collective disobedience to the imperial shatter, not now, but all the way back to 1492, when violence was imposed, uh, imposed as law and its accumulative voracity made history its tool to erase and belittle existing diverse worlds, now regarded to the past, now relegated to the past and standing in the way of imperial progress. Potential history is an effort to make history impossible and to engage with the world from a non-progressive approach, to engage with the outcome of imperial violence as if it is taking place here and now. Potential history is what makes it possible to recognize the right of indigenous people to the lands where imperial nation states were erected. Potential history is what makes us see clearly that centuries of indigenous people's struggle for, and I'm quoting, nothing less than the complete departure of colonial reality, as Nick Estes writes in his, in his account of the long tradition of indigenous resistance, is not part of a lost past, and that Palestine is not 
part of a lost past either. The resistance at Standing Rock in the United States, as well as in Palestine, is here now in the same place that imperial sovereign powers and brigades of historians narrate as past. Potential history allows Palestine to be and to have always have been possible. And from here, I would like to switch to the last part of the call uh, or the fabulation to quote Sadie Hartman, uh, imagine going on strike. Imagine historians using the trust given to their profession and enterprise to go on strike. Imagine the day when they would cease to provide alternative interpretations and new timelines, new ways of sealing the past. Imagine them ceasing to use their power to assert that May 45, sorry, to assert that in May 1945, a world war was ended, or that in July 4th, 1776, a new democratic republic was established, or in May 5th, 1948, the state of Israel was erected. Imagine historians going on strike until stolen lands are called by their old names and the bubble tower of world history with quotation mark collapses. So imperial extraction, conversion, outsourcing and other modalities of domination can no longer be disavowed. Imagine that no alternative history is needed and no history serves any longer as the arbiter of violence. Imagine historians using their symbolic power, resources, and institutional positions in universities, archives, libraries, and publishing houses to go on strike, ceasing to produce farther history books that offer alternatives with quotation mark to existing history, thus affirming the plausibility of this history by being merely in need of revisions Rather, they might use their skills to revise and repair existing books as a mode of intervening in existing narratives and assuming responsibility for what the discipline previously sustained. Imagine them equipped with, artisan, with artisanal tools such as tapes, photos, pens, colors, excerpts of texts, and rubber eraser, and using them to acknowledge that the incommensurable was never the past, but was, was and always is a living force. Imagine them using their power to revoke the sacredness of books kept in libraries and opening closed and opening closed university libraries up to the public. Imagine historians going on strike until street names, maps, and history books are replaced, appended, or discarded altogether. Going on strike means no more archival work for a while, at least until existing histories are repaired. No more time should be spent in archives to look for what descendants of people or a substitute were able against the crimes of the discipline to protect and transmit in place of imperial documents. Historians should withdraw from being the judges or angels of history and instead support and endorse community sourced knowledge. They should go on strike whenever they are asked by their discipline and peers to affirm what the latter should know by now that history is and always was a form of violence. When more than one million women were raped in Germany in the spring of 1945, no war was ended. When 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homeland and were not allowed to return, nothing was established. When millions of African Americans were made uh, sharecroppers, they were made sharecroppers, they continued to be exposed to regime-made disaster, regime-made violence. When millions from India, Africa, China were made indentured workers to solve all of this with quotation mark, the labor problem with quotation mark of the plantation system, slavery was not abolished. Evermore, violence has been required to obscure the rape, 
as lost memories to be discovered, events to be painstakingly reconstituted by scholars working in archive. To repair the violence, historians must go on strike to know that the violence still exists and that there is no such thing as the post-war, with quotation mark, world. Imagine historians ceasing to relate to people they study as primary sources. Imagine them turning their discipline from one that seals destruction in the past to one that tells stories that prepare the ground for the reparation uh, of imperial crimes. Imagine historians rewinding everything, everything made past by their discipline and opening its discourse wide. Imagine historians going on strike, turning accepted imperial facts into criminal evidence and withholding their authority and approval from collecting and recirculating these facts. Imagine historians proclaiming imperial governments previously, previously thought of as accepted regimes, imagining them uh, uh, declare, proclaiming those governments null and void since they were constituted against any body politic that they governed. Imagine historians who understand that what sounds like a heavy charge against them is rather a charge against their discipline, which they have the power to radically change. Imagine historians who, instead of resisting the charges against their discipline, assume collective responsibility for their discipline's corpus, timelines, facts, narratives, and publications. For historians to go on strike means to acknowledge their discipline's failure to see the ongoing resistance of destitute people, the stolen status of lands, the silencing of names, the repression of knowledge, the repression of knowledge formations and other ways of naming and telling, and the transmission of that disavowal to further generations. We were wrong, they would say, and we will not continue to consult state and institutional archive until indigenous people and former colonized people are allowed to enter and take leading roles in decisions about the documents stored there. Ceasing to use archive until such a, a, a co-presence is possible will change the status of the archival document itself. Historians should go on strike until the knowledge of the formerly colonized is allowed to undermine history as it has been practiced and work for the recovery of sustainable worlds. Imagine historians refusing to use their expertise and knowledge until the precedents used to justify injustice are replaced with worldly and non-imperial rights guarded and preserved by those who were destitute beginning with the right to care for the shared world. Imagine historians striking until their work could help repair the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I almost want to start somewhere else. I was planning <laughs> on, yeah, I just want to start somewhere else. I think um, something I'd like to do sort of early on is just to, to put into motion and, and into context some of the, the central concepts in the book, um, the terminology, the, the sort of the, 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 the repeating figures and motifs. Um, and I wondered if we could start with imperial shutter, um, which is a term that, that, that comes up right from, I think, even the preface and, and recurs throughout the book. And obviously, as some, I mean, I came to your work through the civil contract of photography, and, and for me, you know, that work pr presented a really profound revaluation of, of how photography's social, inherently social nature um, is inseparable from a kind of politics of encounter that's, that, can, that can occur across time. So to see, to see the kind of figure of the camera, the lens, the shutter return in this work was compelling, and I think it does so in a way that's quite distinct um, from what you were doing in that, in that book in 2008. And so, I, I just want to point to a couple of places where you kind of give a quick definition of the imperial shutter, and I'll ask if you could give it some, some context. Mm -hmm. So, let me see. 
So you write that unlearning photography as a field apart means first and foremost foregrounding the regime of imperial rights that made its emergence possible. And the imperial shutter in, in this context is something that abets an unthinking assumption that subsequent to its creation, photography will affirm the world to be awash in images and objects to be possessed. And you write, reproduction is understood in this context as a neutral procedure to be used by those who own the proper means for it and regardless of the will of those from whom the objects have been expropriated. And you're talking here about um, a notion of separability, a, a certain kind of um, right to the division and, and, and to ownership of objects. Could you, could you give some context to this idea of the imperial shutter? Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing the imperial shutter. I think it's really crucial to uh, the, you know, I don't know, the entire goal or itinerary of the book because I think that the way that the world is being shaped and we all know it, you know, through racial capitalism and imperialism, etc made all of us somehow complicit because we are all the time being uh, uh, presented to uh, bits and pieces of lives. And we engage with them without being able to, first of all, acknowledge that these are bits and pieces of lives because they are being framed as art objects. They are being framed as photographs, to come back to the notion of photography. And uh, while the shutter, which is a mechanical device in the camera, is understood only through technical features of the camera as part of the progressive history of uh, camera and other technological devices as something that improves all the time uh, the nature of the photographs, it leads us to think or to relate to photography in those progressive terms. And it leads us, it lures us even, it seduces us to uh, relate to photography through those outcomes, mm -hmm. through those products, items, the photographs. We encounter photographs. Uh, so we can interpret them differently. We can have a kind of critical approach to photographs, but we forget about photography mm -hmm. in general, uh, about the event of photography where this photograph was taken, and we also are being invited or seduced to forget that photography was not invented with the device. Mm -hmm. Photography was invented in 1492, in my understanding. Mm -hmm. It was invented in 1492 when the world started to be sliced, when the world was transformed into resources to be extracted, mm -hmm. when people were transformed in themselves into resources to be exploited. And uh, this brings us immediately to photography because photography was uh, 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 invented by imperial powers as something that capture what is out there. But what is out there was already violently transformed and shaped since 1492. So when the camera comes, it affirms, it acknowledges what is out there, but it is actually what is out there through imperial violence. So the question is how we suspend the shutter but I will suspend the shutter, not the shutter of the device, but I will suspend the shutter all the way back to 1492 and uh, uh, go on strike to accept everything that was built on this uh, initial shutter, I would say, or this, uh, this set of initial shutters that were uh, 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 laid down. Uh, slowly, slowly in different places. And just one more, one word about 1492. When I'm speaking about 1492, it is on the one hand the chronological moment of uh, 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 the invasion into what was called New Worlds, but it's also the expulsion of Jews and uh, Muslims from uh, Spain and Portugal. It's also the witch hunt. It's also uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and the uh, mass uh, project of enslavement, and on and on and on. So when I'm speaking about the uh, imperial shutter, of photography, it's actually the imperial shutter that separated people from their lives, that separated the image of a person from the person, that separated what belonged to someone from what is from now on belong to someone else. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I was remem remembering this section from Jonathan Crary's Techniques of, of the Observer, who gives you a wonderful blurb um, on your book, and he wrote that the photograph becomes a central element not only in the new commodity economy, but in reshaping an entire territory on which signs and images can effectively 
can each be effectively severed from their referent circular in periphery. And he starts to sort of elaborate this, this homology between the photograph and the commodity. And I think that notion of a right to kind of expropriate um, and to divide in these sort of spatial and temporal ways is, is inseparable from a kind of thinking that would then arrive at photography. Um, so in a way, there's this sort of, I was, I was thinking also of Jeffrey Batchelor's Burning with Desire when I was reading this and how much further back you've gone um, than him in that thinking of a kind of proto-photography that precedes what we think of as the capital P photography. But, but thinking of that sort of notion of division, could we talk a bit that there's a, a phrase that comes up in the book a lot that I think also does some really important foundational conceptual work, which is the, the tripartite or the triple imperial division. And at the, in the early part of the book, you talk about it in terms of a division uh, that, that's enacted in space and time and that's a, as a principle or a mode of differentiation. And towards the back, differentiation also sort of oscillates between differentiation and politics. Um, and it would be, I think, helpful to, to talk about how foundational this, this principle of division is to imperial violence. Yeah, so it is related to your first question about the shutter because actually those divisions, the tri tripartite uh, uh, imperial division that I'm speaking about, the spatial, uh, the temporal, and then the body politic, is the operation of the shutter. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the way that certain technology of violence enable the separation in time, in space, and in body politic between what is in and what is out, for example. Imagine the campaign of evacuating hundreds of thousands of people and drawing a border tied to, this is the special uh, uh, division, tied to a temporal division that would say from now on the place that exists no longer exists and we have a new place. So we are in a temporal division. And the third one, the third facet of this division is in the body politic, that from now on, certain people will be uh, 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 invited with less violence to inhabit the position of uh, citizens, and all the others will be compelled and forced to inhabit other positions. Undocumented refugees, uh, uh, slaves, uh, infiltrators, and it goes on and on and on. When you under understand these three uh, facets of uh, imperial violence, we understand how crucial is the uh, structured complicity of photography, of historians, and all the other experts, because we are being invited to build on these divisions. Who would say that Israel doesn't exist? You will be treated from anti-Semit to uh, many other, uh, even be arrested, even be uh, fired from your job, because you cannot, as an historian, not to relate to Israel, and that everything that was produced in Israel, like Israeli art, Israeli dance, Israeli history, Israeli everything, as if Palestine does not exist, which in the imagination create, because as we all know, Palestinians exist, as we all know, indigenous people here exist, and they don't exist in another planet, but it creates in the mind this kind of division that if Palestine would exist one day, it will be either on the tiny, tiny land that is left to them, or as the state of the enemy, but anyhow, outside of the imaginary that uh, the imperial violence generated as the place of the new, of the new state that was established, the new temporality that historians are being compelled to follow. So the uh, shutter is really what, uh, 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 at the moment, the brutal moment, like you know, a guillotine, it is defined, it determines the certain, the, a person that will be pushed farther the border will become a refugee. And now there is very little, you know, a way how to go back from it. In, through uh, uh, when we understand the way that those mechanisms are working. There are plenty of ways to go outside of this loop if we imagine those uh, uh, systems as being reversible, as being possibly, uh, as we can rewind them, we can claim uh, uh, their rever reversibility. And what preoccupies me in the book a little bit is how, as scholars, we can do it in our uh, disciplines or across our disciplines. Yeah, I mean, that brings me kind of perfectly on to um, the first of those <coughs> companions I mentioned I wanted to bring into the conversation. 
Um, you write actually just you know close to the section that you were reading earlier. We have to acknowledge that within a context of imperialism, history is not telling stories about a neutral world, but that history itself is a modality and a symptom of imperial violence. And you know where you talk there about a kind of disciplinary segregation. I was thinking of two different passages that, that sprung to mind as I was reading the book, and one comes from John Berger's book, Hold Everything Dear, who, and he crops up in, in your book as well. He writes an essay in here called, Where Are We? And in the essay, I think in a sense he's, you know, he's speaking very much in sympathy with what you've just been describing. He says, most analyses and prognoses about what is happening are understandably presented and studied within the framework of their separate disciplines. Economics, politics, media studies, public health, ecology, national defense, criminology, education, etc. In reality, each of these separate fields is joined to one another to make up the real terrain of what is being lived. It happens that in their lives, people suffer from wrongs which are classified in separate categories, whereas they suffer them simultaneously and inseparably. To take in what is happening, an interdisciplinary vision is necessary in order to connect the fields which are institutionally kept separate. Any such vision is bound to be, in the original sense of the word, political. The precondition for thinking politically on a global scale is to see the unity of the unnecessary suffering taking place. And I, I wondered whether you might respond to that sort of that, that, that claim that he's making there in the context of a sort of move backward and the way the prefix re crops up in your, in your book so much as sort of almost a, an insistence on collapsing both these spatial and temporal divisions but also these, these kind of territorial and disciplinary divisions to get back to something like what he's calling the real terrain of what is lived. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you. As you brought it, one companion, let me bring. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let me bring another companion mm -hmm. uh, to m take the uh, conversation a little bit outside of all, only you know writers and how uh, uh, this, how speaking, uh, our potential histories actually. Uh, an attempt to think uh, with others. Mm -hmm. So it can be John Berger, it can be many, many others. And I would like to respond maybe through this example, which is uh, um, Tamara Lanier, uh, who is the descendant of uh, uh, Renty Taylor, who is being uh, uh, photographed here, was forced uh, 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 to be photographed as part of being forced to be a slave as part of being kidnapped from Africa. Uh, and uh, what Tamara Lanier is doing uh, uh, while filing a lawsuit, she filed a lawsuit against Harvard, is trying to reverse everything that imperial violence is doing by claiming that uh, slavery was abolished only in documents, but uh, uh, slavery uh, continues as far as the uh, universities, libraries, museums continue, that were part of uh, the project of slavery, continue to exercise the same violence. Um, so what you have here is uh, the way that Tamara Lanier circulated this image uh, that she designed together with her daughter uh, as part of the campaign Free Renty, bound by Harvard, now it's already 170 years uh, a slave. Um, and I think that when you ask me about John Berger, and I know that we have uh, some other uh, names that will uh, join us, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to say something about the, uh, the, the position from which I'm speaking in potential history. It's uh, an attempt not to position myself vis-a-vis -vis others who are thinking, but to speak with others with whom I would like to speak. So it's uh, joining others. Uh, it is based on the assumption that uh, rather than thinking about what we are doing in terms of looking for new paths or looking to innovate, is how we can find those with whom uh, we speak in order to amplify, to get to amplify some claims that were not responded yet some uh, attempt to remedy the world that were not, could not be brought into completion. 
Um, so, uh, and I think that with Tamara Lanier, what we have is uh, very interesting in relation to what preoccupy both of us in terms of photography, is an invitation to reimagine photography from the very beginning. Because while she uh, uh, claims uh, uh, that this photo, she, a uh, restitution claim to have this photograph back to her hands, which means back, and I would like to show it back to her, uh, to her hands, which is a claim to say that we cannot deal with all photographs in the same way. The same that we cannot deal with all uh, documents in the same way or all maps in the same way. This photograph is part of violence as long as this photograph is being kept under the protocols of museums, neutral museums and imperial paradigm. His place, Renty Taylor's place, is in her hands, in, his fam in her family. So what she's doing when she uh, uh, files this lawsuit is positioning herself as an in, uh, uh, inheritor of his claim that could not be a, a voice, that could not be heard at the time, and uh, uh, claiming that photography can be reconfigured or reconceptualized and even legally be reinscribed differently as something that cannot be dealt with with universal terms. Mm -hmm. That all photographs should be preserved, that all photographs should enjoy a certain type of care uh, that is the care that the museum offers. So what we have with uh, Tamara Lanier, when we uh, understand it as a challenge to the entire discipline, what we have is the possibility to understand how we can be in dialogue with different voices that are not necessarily in order to uh, create genealogies of scholarship, but uh, a possibility or an opportunity to challenge the premises of uh, systems that started to be shaped in 1492. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the remarkable thing about the, you know, Renty and also Delia's daguerreotype is, um, you know, the, the, those images were produced in order to help in the theorization of se the separate evolution of racial species, in quotation marks. There's, they're daguerreotypes, so that there aren't, there, it, they are both the negative and the positive, that they're all in one. Um, and precisely because the people who were depicted in the, in the moment of that, of their creation, were objects and property, they were not in a position to give consent. And so Tamara is able to use the law, the, the, the principle of the property law to say, well, since these people couldn't give consent, then these are objects that were produced against their will. And since I can prove my direct, direct lineage from them, property law, in fact, requires that you return them to me and any and all profits that are derived from them. So the, the very logic of the undoing of the expropriation is present in the room in 1851 when the photographs are being made, unbeknownst to the people who are enacting the violence. Um, even if, you know, I would argue, and I'm sure as, as you do in the book, those who are appearing in the image are very, are very much aware of precisely how unjust the violence is um, and that it can make no, no stable claim to legitimacy, whatever the kind of artifice of law might say about it. Um, so, so maybe we could um, talk a bit there actually about, um, we sort of come back to photography now, I was planning to go elsewhere, but if we could talk a bit about the way that you discuss photography in relationship to the commons, um, if I could read a couple of quotations from the book briefly. So you write, photographs do not speak for themselves. They're usually, they're usually filed carelessly in the archive with little information about their provenance. This careless handling of photographs, however, cannot be an excuse for ignoring them. We should refuse to forfeit the enormous body of knowledge that the material world provides at the same time that we should also refrain from reprinting them automatically in the name of exposing what is in them, as if under imperialism capturing mainly colonized people in photos and circulating their images was not also used as a tool against them. We can attend to how in photographs and through photography, imperial dividing lines can fail to materialize. A little early in the book you also write, Photographs should always be studied in connection to what the shutter sought to keep disconnected from what we are invited to see. And in the book, I think in a number of instances you do this, you, you deliberately take up a stance um, that's motivated by a desire to reimagine the photograph um, as against its kind of intentional exclusions. And this often has to do with the caption, um, where you, you, for the most part, refuse to reprint them. And then in some instances, you've also you've drawn by hand, um, a photograph that you yourself are seeing. 
So could you perhaps speak a bit about this, 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 um, the kind of critical responsibility that we need to bring to bear on our looking? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Stanley. Uh, just one word about Tamama Lanier as a beginning of an answer, and then I will show maybe two other. So uh, the two examples of images that I showed uh, from the, uh, in connection to the lawsuit filed by Tamara Lanier are images where you are actually invited to experience photography in a different way. Here, uh, uh, rather than looking at it only as a photograph of Tamara Lanier with a photograph of her great-great-grandfather, you should look at it as uh, uh, the manifestation or as the performance of how this photograph should be, uh, should exist in the world, in her hands, in her family, and in the way that she defines the way that we look at it. So you are not invited to look at what is here as it is, as this photograph circulates by Harvard or Peabody, the photograph that was taken by Zilli uh, when uh, several people who were enslaved were forced to this uh, photographic studio to be taken in this photograph, and especially when I'm thinking about the two women, they passed through, I think I counted it at the time, at the Civil Contract of Photography, something like seven or eight white male that uh, 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 handed their body from one person to the other. So this is one way to uh, relate to photograph. And the other one is this one, which again, you don't have, uh, you are not encountering uh, the pure image, only the image devoid it from the context. What you're encountering is the way that Tamara Lanier and her daughter uh, 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 shape the image for you to see it. So rather than having this unmediated access to the image that Harvard has the right to circulate it forever because they allegedly own the rights to this uh, image, what we see is the way that here Tamara Lanier mediates the image. And it is, I think, a challenge and a question that many of us are asking, either you're a photographer, so which kind of photographs we can take today? And in my case, as I'm not taking photographs beyond what everybody is taking with the iPhone, uh, uh, for, to co immediately communicate is how I can reduce the presence of certain images, not only photograph in the world. So to come back to your question, I would like to, uh, sorry. I would like to go to this image. Uh, I would like to go to this image that is still classified in the archive. This is image that was taken by uh, Timothy O'Sullivan as a series of uh, images, and it is still classified in the Library of Congress as uh, five generation of, uh, of uh, slave, five generation of slaves on J.J. Uh, uh, Smith plantation uh, in South Carolina, and uh, these are not slaves. This is not J.J. Smith plantation. And all this lures us as uh, scholars to relate to it as if we are looking at five generations of slaves on a J.J. Smith's plantation. And when I'm saying this, is not that I will come up with new information to convince you that they are not. Even in the most basic way, we cannot relate to it, neither as the plantation of J.J. Smith, nor to them as slaves. We are speaking uh, about a moment after what uh, Du Bois calls the general strike that determines the outcome of slavery and, uh, and the Civil War, when 250,000 uh, enslaved people ran away from the plantations and uh, went on strike. Uh, so we are speaking about a moment when they are even legally, from the perspective of the abusive legal system uh, of the United States, they are no longer slaves. Uh, and uh, the plantation never belonged to J.J. Smith. It, it plundered, you know, what enabled it to be his own. But even at that moment, he ran away. Uh, uh, and they are already working the land uh, as their own. So they are people who are claiming their rights in the land. And uh, we are speaking about, again, what Du Bois uh, uh, describes as black reconstruction. So there is a question here. What do we do with this image? So in this context, I can show it uh, 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 and speak about it. But how can we imagine, the, uh, let's say, the afterlife, not of slavery, but the afterlife of images of slavery that were part of the constitution of slavery. 
So I don't think that we can come up with the best you know, way to approach it, but we can, uh, I think we have a right, we have a, a duty, an obligation, not to let these images perpetuate like this. So I would like to share with you two, uh, uh, two ways to think about them, because you asked me about what do we do uh, with the caption? And so it's not only about the caption. It's one way to revise the caption. But the other way is to ask when uh, 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 following the general strike, when uh, enslaved people freed themselves from slavery, somehow, due to the imperial shutter, they were not reassociated with the wealth of objects that was plundered from Africa this continued to be the wealth of white people. This continued to be the resource, the deposit for white people to create exhibition of black art, the first art exhibition in the MoMA 36, the first art exhibition in Brooklyn Museum in New York in 1920. So the question is, are we overcome this separation of the shutter between the first forced migration of people and the uh, other forced migration of objects from the same place in Africa, how we can, in, uh, in our imagination and in the way that we let these images to exist, how we can think about them together, how we can overcome uh, or how we can uh, suspend the operation of the shutter in a way that what was plundered will not be associated only with one world and uh, uh, the fate of the case for reparation will be questioned only in relation to what was done uh, to people. So this is one image and this is, uh, uh, sorry, where is it? And this is another which is based on uh, another photograph <coughs> by Timothy O'Sullivan and the 100 objects that uh, were shown to uh, costumes uh, uh, to make sure that the MoMA works with uh, under the legal system and they didn't plunder anything because the provenance of all these objects is uh, other European or US museums and not, because this was already erased, not plundered from Africa. But all of them were plundered from Africa and found their ways to all these other museums. But here what we have in this photograph just before the opening of the exhibition at the MoMA, we have the performance of legality. We are working under the law. We are working under the rule of law. And uh, these images, and we know the uh, Jim Crow laws at the same time, we know the, uh, uh, the way that slavery was transformed into indentured workers, sharecroppers, etc., because the wealth of objects continued to be owned by uh, those institutions that were able to reproduce the regimes, the regime a disaster under which people continue to be uh, kept. And uh, just one more thing to connect this to uh, Tamara Lanier. Tamara Lanier in her lawsuits, uh, she speaks about the image was seized from Renty Taylor. But we know that Renty Taylor didn't own the image, right? Because the image, the uh, photograph, the daguerreotype were taken from uh, Renty Taylor and they never have access to this daguerreotype. So th this is what makes, I think, a, a lawsuit so radical because she speaks about the seizure of the image without the object of the image. The image was seized from him even though he never had access to the image that was seized from him. Uh, so so she, knew, she knew about the event of photography before you published the book? Of course, this yeah. is potential history. You just say the obvious of what people should know if they will not be under the spell of imperialism. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that I, I'm immediately drawn to sort of point out there. One is that um, I'm going to have the great good fortune of being in conversation with Ariella again on Friday the 3rd of April at the RISD Museum as part of a conference that's happening there. And we will talk there about this image and a whole section of the book having to do with collecting and museums. I think the RISD Museum is a much more optimal place in which to have a conversation about what you're saying in the book there about those questions. But this also makes me think, and could you go back to the overlaid one where you've blended this image with the, with the previous one? Yeah. So this also makes me think about this term, I'm guessing a bunch of people in the room will know this phrase, parallel reconstruction. Have people heard about this? Right, so. Parallel reconstruction is a term that the Drug Enforcement Agency uses when it uses illegal wiretaps the NSA has, has, has been conducting 
to falsely construct a probable cause to then indict or search somebody's property to then you know, accuse them of a crime. So what it, what it boils down to is that an illegal wiretap serves as the basis for the, for, for the act of trying to indict someone for breaking the law, right? And in a sense, I'm thinking here, you know, in the way that you're talking about this sort of this, this parallel route of seizure, right, and, and the sort of legalization of these objects, that what's happening in that photograph that we saw, you know, from the MoMA is an act of parallel reconstruction. Is that in fact we know quite fundamentally how illegal the obtenance of these objects was, but we can establish a kind of probable cause by going through the ritual of the kind of procedure and, and the legality. Um, but I just wanted to circle back to the to the um, to the Timothy Sullivan picture for a second. Um, the five generations. Yes, yeah. Um, with the yeah that one that version. Because just a little bit after you, you publish it in the book, you write this line, potential history means recognizing that the photographed persons are in the midst of an attempt to claim what is owed them in exchange for that, for what was stolen from them and as an advancement for their due reparations. And you, you say in the midst, and I think this is a good moment for us to come back to the way that you're interested in a non-imperial temporality which is to say one in which we cannot in any, con in any kind of concurrence sense separate past from present or present from future. So if these actions, if we understand when we're looking that things are happening in the same moment that we ourselves are encountering them, then the question of agency is central to the interpretive responsibility of the viewer, which then means that the caption doesn't have the same likely capacity to impose its hegemonic interpretation on the photograph. Um, could you talk a bit more about this temporality and relationship to, 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 to watching as opposed to the kind of static look? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that, as you pointed out, it has different, uh, different aspects, this attempt to uh, be in different temporalities than the imperial one. So one of them, when I'm saying that they're in the midst, is uh, unlike the property regime, the imperial property regime, that when a uh, uh, person lives is a person is kidnapped from his, his or her life and being transformed into a refugee, into an, uh, a slave, uh, or an object is plunder and is being transformed into a work of art. This happens in the same brevity, 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 brevity yeah. of the camera shutter. It's at once. All the, the entire regime of property is built on that, that the moment you sign is transformative. Mm -hmm. And when I'm speaking about these people in the midst of claiming their rights to the land, it's not acquiring another uh, document to testify the day of the land. It's they are in the midst because they were already laboring this land when they were enslaved. They continue to labor it acknowledging for themselves that this is their own, acknowledging for others or proclaiming vis-a-vis -vis others that this is theirs through their labor. So it is not about the document that transforms uh, something from one reality to the other. Because the document under the imperial regime has this kind of brutal violence of transforming realities at once. So this is one, I think, uh, uh, layer of this non-imperial temporality, that it's not the expectation of the repetition of the same imperial violence. And the other one that you uh, asked me about, which is our role as uh, uh, viewers. So I think that in general, as scholars, but it is very present in photography and all these, you know, uh, you just wrote a brilliant article about Roland Barthes and all this ideology of that this was there, this kidnapping of time. Uh, time is being stolen from people by saying that it belonged to the past. And as scholars or viewers, we are supposed to look at this as something from the past. So we are supposed to accept all the signifiers that tell us that they are slaves, they are forever slaves. The plantation is J.J. Smith plantation, forever J.J. Smith plantation. So there is something about the technology of the archive and the technology of photography that, which we, with which it is intertwined that make us to repeat all the time one type of facts. And this is mm. the crime of historians. Mm. Rather than us understanding our role as 
existing with the photographed person and with their claim. If they are claiming now their right to the land, this is what we have to attend to. To, of course, the case for reparation goes without saying, but more than that, to imagine rights differently than the property regime. To imagine that we are responding to what, uh, uh, from, we are responding in the way that they were deprived from being responded, that their rights in the land will be recognized. So rather than accepting all this regime that reiterate that the property forever is J.J. Smith, and if not his, all the other legal owners, how we respond to their uh, 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 presence in uh, joining them in imagining a different regime of right that should have come out of the abolition of slavery. So here, Tamara Lanier is really pivotal because she says, uh, Renty Taylor is still enslaved at Harvard. Abol slavery was abolished, but he's still a slave at Harvard. So it's the understanding, the radical understanding mm -hmm. that the abolition of slavery is not completed, not only through the institutions, but through us as viewers, as photographers, as scholars. And it's not about uh, you know, an excellent scholarship that we could break it. It's, it is only when it will become our lingua franca, the language that we share and we don't try to uh, 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 appropriate as what we invented. When we position ourselves as responding to uh, claims that are already there. Yeah, I think, I think it would be good maybe for us to sort of touch on that, that phrase that you mentioned a little bit earlier, that regime made disaster. And then it, I think it might be good for us to discuss the archive because it's, it's, you know, it's with us so, so forcefully. And in the book, you, you write, to contradistinguish you know, the term regime made disaster from disaster, you write, a disaster is associated with an event, often a spectacular one that erupts from the outside, bursting in and devastating a whole area. In the face of such a disaster, sovereign power is reflected by its deeds, immediate decision-making to allocate resources and manpower and organize procedures to stop and contain the disaster, reduce its destructive effects, prevent its expansion and cope with its repercussions. Such are earthquakes or hurricanes or the destruction of the Twin Towers or what is called a terror attack in Western cities. This kind of disaster tends to be inscribed in official timelines and collective memory. It becomes an object of orchestrated mourning and yearly commemoration. Regime-made disaster, however, is ongoing. Regime-made disaster is at one and the same time the expression of the differential principle of the regime and what stabilizes it. That, I think that last bit's really important, right? That regime-made disaster is at one and the same time the expression of the differential principle of the regime and what stabilizes it. Can you, can you talk about that, that concept? Um, yeah. So, um, I think that maybe, you know, the, it's not that I want to underestimate, but the hysteria around the coronavirus is maybe an opportunity to think about this. What is being made, def what def is being defined as a disaster that the regimes, the imperial regimes are responding to? Uh, in an immediacy. They are immediately quarantining people. They are stopping flights. Maybe something good will come out of it, which maybe the global regime will collapse if they will stop flights between places. But, uh, but I think that uh, when I'm speaking about regime, a disaster is the way that uh, the regimes are not external to the sovereign power, but they are actually what constitutes the sovereign power. Uh, so regime disaster are uh, disasters that we are its operators in a way. And we, it's a very broad we, uh, regardless of where we are coming from, regardless the different positions that we occupy as operators of these technologies that generate and perpetuate regime disaster, we are being uh, 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 implicated in the operation of this regime a disaster because they are inscribed in these tripartite uh, uh, division, imperial division lines. 
We are uh, 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 the operators of the regime as citizens, as undocumented, as refugees, etc., etc. We operate the temporal and the spatial lines that uh, enable those uh, uh, disasters to be reproduced. Um, so when I'm speaking about regime a disaster, I'm speaking actually about what other people can call democratic regimes. Uh, so, because democracies, d democracies that we know, and I don't think that we know any others, uh, they reproduce those uh, regime made disaster. When we think about the invention of the US, when we think about the invention of Israel as democracies, uh, it's actually you know, in either slave owners or perpetrators who are being responsible for the expulsion of uh, hundreds of thousands of people or the destruction of places that are becoming the embodiment of the rule of law. Uh, and uh, their regime cannot uh, uh, last or cannot be reproduced without those disaster. So we cannot think about those disaster as something that will uh, disappear or that anyone has any intention to bring to an end. They are being uh, 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 part or constitutive elements of the political regimes. So you know, I have several hats that I'm wearing and I'm resisting to wear, but one of them is political theorist. And uh, you know, when you l study or when you read political theorist, all this is outside of the discourse of democracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy has its own genealogy. Human rights have their own genealogies. Everything has its own histories or its own theories. Everything is separated, again, along these shutter uh, lines. Uh, and disasters are also being studied as if they are not part of the political regime that reproduce them. Uh, so this is the attempt of the book, is to try to account for those disasters rather than to uh, uh, what is considered or what is shaped as a disaster by those regimes without, by the way, underestimating the disastrous aspect of those other disasters, but just acknowledging that they are uh, one type of disaster and certainly not what is in a, uh, a perpetual uh, form of existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that the extent to which these kinds of forms of violence act as a stabilizing forces you know, almost can't be overstated. Um, and that's something else that I think also lurks in, 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 in real proximity to, the, to the, the concept of the regime made disaster is the archive, which, you know, in this book, you, I think you go to, to great lengths to, and I'm not sure if you'd be happy with this term, I'm quite happy to sort of, you know, <laughs> for you to correct it, but I, I've been thinking that you deterritorialize the archive, right? The, the figure of the archive, and particularly if you sort of orbit in, you know, the art academia space that I do, is always architectural and processual, and you know it's the pen, it's the pencil, it's the it's the file filing cabinet, right? It's all of these figures, and I think in the book you you do a lot of work to clarify quite how extensively, habitually, and heedlessly we interact with its categories, um, and you write unlearning the archive as dictated by its official mission starts with a disavowal of the spatial and temporal regime it institutes which would suggest that the violent differentiation of Israeli citizenship, um, which, excuse me, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> uh, that the Israeli state is predicated on an archival regime is somehow separable in time and space, just as that archival regime's inner logic is notionally confined to the edifice in which its documents and processes rest. And then I think a bit later on here you say, yeah, and you're talking here with your companion or Palestinian companion, that he was deprived of the archives that existed in Palestine and was made first a vagabond, then a dweller of a refugee camp, and soon an infiltrator, in inverted commas, then a stateless person, a person with no papers at all. His non-citizenship is also predicated on an archival regime, right? So quite beyond the walls of the building, quite separate from, well, not, well, beyond the parameters of the filing cabinet, right? There are these terminologies that, that become colloquial. There are these technologies that are conceptual, that are epistemological, that have, have an effect at the level of ontology and that these two you link back to the archival regime. Can you speak more about that? Yeah. Um, 
But maybe just before I'll respond to this, I will go back to the previous discussion that we had and we'll add to your question from there. Uh, when I speak about regime a disaster, it's actually uh, an attempt to understand that what we have in common is violence. Uh, and we have it in common, and we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with this violence? It's out there. So some suffer more than it, some suffer less than it, but it's, this is what we have in common. Why I wanted to start with this when I'm coming back to your question, because uh, the archive, first of all, was construed as something that has a specific aesthetics, the aesthetics of uh, yellowish paper, the aesthetic of dust, the aesthetic of boxes, the aesthetics of document, right? We relate to it through its aesthetics, which already make us complicit with the idea that the archive is the file cabinet, that the archive is a building, that the archive is a deposit, and we are going there to take something from what is out there. But if we understand that we are living under a regime a disaster, that unlike different types of imperialism prior to 1492 is uh, being run, reproduced, and generated through documents, we cannot go to the archive in the same understanding that the archive creates for us that it's about documents. So what you call the deterritorialization of the archive, uh, I don't know, I have to think yeah, well, it, I have to think about it, what I think about this world. It came uh, up at 4 o'clock this afternoon. No, but it, 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 makes, it makes the work in order to, to, to describe what I'm doing, which is deterritorializing the archive from the uh, indoor space. Uh, but I think that it's more than deterritorializing, because deterritorializing presume that first was the building and now I'm deterritorializing. Right, and what I'm right, trying right, right. to do yeah, yeah, is not deterritorializing and by that affirming that the archive was always there and now we are doing something to the archive. What I'm trying to do is to say that the archive is a technology and it's a technology of violence that produces documents rather than preserving documents. So if we understand the technology of the archive as the production, the mass production of documents, and if we understand those documents as <clears throat> weapons that force people to embody those categories, slave, refugee, infiltrator, undocumented, work of art, citizen, we embody it as if it's natural. Other people embody it with friction because their categories are worse than the category of citizen. But we have also to question our category of citizen as we question others. But we embody these categories that uh, define for us a set of uh, uh, protocols that we have to operate. Uh, and for others, even if they are in a very uh, uh, vulnerable uh, they are forced, being forced to inhabit a very uh, brutal category. They are also being forced to uh, operate under certain protocols. So rather than thinking about the archive again as something that is after the fact, we will go there to read documents, we have to understand how those documents that we uh, participate in their production are actually generating the realities for which we are going to consult the archive. And maybe, as you mentioned, the uh, companion, if you don't mind, I'll show, uh, I'll show one or two images. So just, uh, one word about, you know, how do we have to leave these images in the world? So these are two crops from an image that maybe you know it. When you go to the archive and you want to study slavery, the images that you will be shown are images in which the violence is being inscribed in the bodies of the victims. You will not be shown images of the perpetrators, of the enslavers. So my attempt in dealing with all these images is to try to focus on the perpetrators and on the gestures that they are performing. 
as part of enslaving. So here what you have is the person who holds the document, this kind of brevity of the regime of property, which is the transformation of a person into a property. So there is a document. He's holding the document. This is the, uh, 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 how it is called in photography, remind the me? The decisive moment. The decisive moment, yeah, the decisive moment I'm of the imperial about. shatter that Henri Cartier-Bresson made a poetic out of it, but this is brutal violence. So this is the document, and then the, ima the imaginary is that this document, in order to revoke it, we need another document, and you recognize probably better than me, even though I traced him and I learned how he, he looks like with, you know, signing the, uh, the amendment or uh, the uh, proclamation. So we have one document in the imaginary, one document replaces the other, which make, you know, the general strike that Du Bois speak about, as if you know footnote in the history of documents. Mm -hmm. So the question is how the general strike is not being assumed as footnote to the documents, but the other way uh, around. Mm -hmm. So when you are speaking about uh, 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 what I'm trying to do with the archive is rather than us associating uh, uh, archivists with those uh, tedious ants who are uh, working in the archive or ourselves uh, looking at, Im at uh, documents, this is for me the archivist par excellence. Once we understand that is the archivist, the question is how we introduce distance from ourselves as operators of the archive and the archivist. Is the archivist, is not classifying the documents, is producing the documents that we will read. And just in parentheses, by that I'm not saying that we cannot read documents against the grain and along the grain and do many things with them. But uh, it's not only about reading them. We have to understand, we have to keep in mind the way that the archive also produces the documents in, re in relation to which we are reading them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think in the book you talk about this, especially in, in terms of the kinds of agreements that archivists have to make to have access to the Israeli, Israeli state archive, right? That you accept the fiction of the erasure of the Nakba as the principle of entry, right? That these, these documents often enshrine a property which the rights to which is inherently a fiction. Um, and then because it's naturalized, because we operate in and interact with it, 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 it acquires a certain kind of self-evidence. Um, I, I wanted to just, and you know, we've spoken about this a bit, flesh out um, in a couple of questions and open to the room the ways that, that um, I think your, your book also compels us to deal in, with a certain kind of complexity in relationship to documents and to preservation of the archive. So there's, there's a, a section of, of the book where you, know, you, you cite John Tagg saying that that the notion that any kind of civic procedure around the archive could somehow regulate its inherent violences is a fiction and that really, you know, we're sort of subsumed by the apparatus of it and what we need to do is to smash it and you say no. Um, and, and as I was reading that part of the book, I was also reading some poetry by the Kashmiri poet Aga Shaheed Ali. And he has this poem called A Country Without a Post Office. And I, I swear to God, I thought that, that he, he was writing it while reading your book. Um, so I'm just going to read the first three sections of it. And I'm thinking of the fact that Kashmir in the moment is, of course, in a, in a blackout as I, as I do this. Again, I've returned to this country where a minaret has been entombed. Someone soaks the wicks of clay lamps in mustard oil. Each night climbs its steps to read messages scratched on planets. His fingerprints cancel blank stamps in that archive for letters with doomed addresses each house buried or empty, empty, because so many fled, ran away, and became refugees there, in the plains where they must now will a final dewfall to turn the mountains to glass. They'll see us through them, see us frantically bury houses to save them from fire that like a wall caves in. The soldiers light it, hone the flames, burn our world to sudden papier-mâché, inlaid with gold, then ash. When the muezzin died, the city was robbed of every call. The houses were swept about like leaves for burning. Now every night we bury our houses and theirs, the ones left empty. We are faithful. On their doors we hang wreaths 
More faithful each night, fire again is a wall, and we look for the dark as it caves in. We're inside the fire, looking for the dark. One card lying on the street says, I want to be he who pours blood to soak your hands, or I'll leave mine in the cold till the rain is ink, and my fingers at the edge of pain are seals all night to cancel the stamps. The mad guide. The lost speak like this. They haunt a country when it is ash. Phantom heart, pray he's alive. I've returned in rain to find him, to learn why he never wrote. I've brought cash, a currency of paisleys to buy the new stamps, rare already, blank, no nation named on them. Without a lamp, I look for him in houses buried, empty. He may be alive, opening doors of smoke, breathing in the dark his ash refrain. Everything is finished, nothing remains. I must force silence to be a mirror to see his voice again for directions. Fire runs in waves. Should I cross that river? Each post office is boarded up. Who will deliver parchment cut in paisleys? My news to prisons. Only silence can now trace my letters to him. Or, in a dead office, the dark pains. The entire map of the lost will be candled. I'm keeper of the minaret since the muezzin died. Come soon, I'm alive. There's almost a paisley against the light, sometimes white, then black. The glutinous wash is wet on its back as it blossoms into autumn's final country. Buy it, I issue it only once, at night. Come before I'm killed, my voice cancelled. In this dark rain, be faithful, phantom heart. This is your pain. Feel it. You must feel it. Nothing will remain. Everything's finished. I see his voice again. This is a shrine of words. You'll find your letters to me and mine to you. Come soon and tear open these vanished envelopes. And I reach the minaret. I'm inside the fire. I have found the dark. This is your pain. You must feel it. Feel it, heart. Be faithful to this mad refrain. For he soaked the wicks of clay lamps, lit them each night as he climbed these steps to read messages scratched on planets. His hands were seals to cancel the stamps. This is an archive. I found the remains of his voice, that map of longings with no limit. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm thinking here about the way, and it's actually, you know, almost where we began in a sense. You, you have these gray sections that interleave the book, the imagine, and that each time it's the sort of imperative imprecation, imagine. Um, there are all these ways, and of course in the writing of each section you repeat that phrase of the beginning of the sentence so that there's a kind of rhythmic intonation to it. The, there, there is a kind of, like, it's not just a grammar, but there's, there's a... There's a certain kind of poetry at work in those sections, and there's a way that, at least for me, it seems to clarify that you're trying to describe a praxis or a practice um, or, a, or a kind of ritual gesture, and it's, it's one that calls for and depends upon a kind of collective activity, right? Um, you know, where you're describing, for instance, a kind of temporality in which past, present, and future are, are understood to be simultaneous, and these things are ongoing, we have to narrate their ongoingness and uncover it to one another in order to establish a relationship to it, right? And so in, 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 in Ali's poetry, it's the letter, um, you know, the sort of means in a, in a moment, of, in, in a place of darkness, in a, in a geography of division and separation, of reestablishing contiguity between peoples who, whose bodies are, are, are being separated in all the ways we've discussed earlier. And I just wondered whether you could talk a bit about um, those, those forms of communication and connection um, those kinds of documents, those kinds of interactions um, that sustain these kinds of collective bonds. Because there are obviously, as you've just been saying, um, and as you uncover in the book, especially in the instance of those, uh, you know, the moments where you touch on slave narratives, things are being, we, we are being addressed in the present by people who wish for us to know I'm here, I'm alive. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> um, 
I'm trying to think from which entry point to, uh, to get in uh, the answer. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe I'll say something about <clears throat> something more biographical. Mm -hmm. um, something that I found myself saying every, every time when I'm thinking about the book, not so many times, but the few times that I had to speak about the book. <clears throat> we are being born somewhere, and this imperial regime not only defined our status, but defined also where do we belong? And where do we belong is defined by certain tensions and contradictions. Uh, and we inhabit this position differently, right? At different moments in our life. And uh, sometimes we don't see beyond these tensions or positions that we were born to inhabit. And uh, I think that writing this book, uh, you speak, you ask me about how do we respond to other voices. Writing this book was for me part of my uh, migration to the US. When I left uh, this place called Israel uh, seven years ago, I had a feeling that my book is almost done. And uh, when I moved here, I realized that, wow, no, I cannot publish here anything before I understand where am I living. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book turned out from being one thing to be a completely different thing, but maybe the same thing, I don't know. Uh, but it, take, it took me 10 years all in all to write it. and. Uh, what happened when I moved here is that, first of all, I had to retrain myself in relation to the history of this place, mainly stolen lands and slavery. And this became, uh, and it was part of uh, thinking uh, farther than I was able to from Palestine to think about those 500 years of uh, imperialism. Um, <clears throat> but what it helped me understand is understand Palestine not through its exceptionalism, either from the perspective of Palestine or from the perspective of Israel, but to understand Palestine as the reiteration of the same imperial violence. And when I understood Palestine as the part of the reiteration of the same imperial violence, not only uh, I understood that, but somehow I was able to see myself outside of the imaginary in which I was born, which was born to be an Israeli Jew, born to be an Israeli Jew, a Mizrahi Jew, a Sephardic Jew, which is the, uh, 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 the black Jews of the white Jews, being the perpetrators of the Palestinians, but being in the position of the inferior uh, Jews vis-a-vis -vis the white Jews that created the white supremacist state. And when I moved here, it allowed me to understand the history of 1492 actually as my own biography, which allowed, and I'm trying to say what does it mean to speak with others. At a very late moment, when I moved here, my father passed away and I saw in his documents that he concealed from us the name of our grandmother, which was Aisha, which is the name that I adopted the moment when my father died. Uh, and actually what he did is trying to whiten us, whiten himself of course, but whiten us without telling us. So I knew some things about my father trying to whiten us, but I didn't know how far it went in concealing from us the Arabness of our family. And it was a very long process of unlearning. So when I'm speaking about unlearning, when I'm speaking about regime disasters, it sounds very theoretical, but actually it's a very personal trajectory to understand uh, how much I had to unlearn in order, in retrospect, to understand what was the accent of my father, actually, that made it this accent, this particular accent. It couldn't be this accent if my father didn't speak Arab Arabic, but it never occurred to me that my father spoke Arabic. And another thing, <clears throat> 
that never occurred to me that actually the language that I stopped hearing when I was nine years old when my grandmother died is the mother tongue of my mother, which is Ladino. My mother spoke with her mother, Ladino, and I heard this language at home. I didn't know to speak it, but I know several words until today I kept in my memory because this was the language that they spoke. It was a language that I wanted to distinguish myself a little bit because it was the language of these old guys. Uh, and they didn't teach me. They were happy to have a language that they could speak without us knowing. But it's only very late, I think two, three, four years ago, that somehow I had this moment of understanding that this was the language that was not spoken in Bulgaria, where they came from. One part of the family is coming from Algeria, the Arab Jewishness, and one, the other part is coming from Bulgaria. And I knew that they didn't really come from Bulgaria. Sometimes they migrated from Spain, but only three, four years ago, I understood that actually Ladino was the language that they transmitted against all odds from Spain till, I don't know, 50 years ago. And I disrupted the transmission of this language, or actually my mother disrupted the transmission of this language. So uh, when you ask me about this thing in the book, how we can attend to others as if they do not belong to the past, this is the question. The question is how I can today claim my belonging or my attachment uh, to be a Palestinian Jew on the one hand and an Algerian Jew on the other hand against all the mechanisms that made me to be dissociated from these identities, not how I can claim them as identities, but how I can reenact myself together with those who were forced at certain points either to adopt or to embrace imperial identity, or to camouflage a non-imperial identity, or to force me to believe that I was born an Israeli and I'm an Israeli. So speaking with others is an opportunity to continue the unlearning back uh, several generations earlier. And maybe I can show four minutes of a film. Yeah, yeah, is it? The did, yeah, yeah. 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 But I don't know how to do it, let's try it. Maybe I know. So what I would like to show is um, something that will tie some of the questions that Stanley asked me about the archive, about the past, about imperial violence. Um, this is a reenactment uh, of uh, 100 documents from the archive uh, in relation to uh, the UN partition resolution 47 that determined that uh, Palestine should be partitioned like many other places in the world that were partitioned at the same time, India, Pakistan, uh, South Africa, uh, 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 the apartheid regime, uh, Korea, Berlin, the scissors in reality that cut uh, places after cutting many other places in the last 500 years. So. Uh, I read um, many documents in the archive. This was time that I still went to archives in Palestine. I stopped at a certain time. This was still time when I went to the archive. And I read certain, uh, certain documents that historians somehow understood differently than what I read in them. And I read in them civil alliances, civil contracts between Jews and Arabs following the uh, partition resolution by the UN, and they gave promises to each other how to protect their life if nationalists from both sides and the conception of both sides started to uh, take root in their imagination too, will come and try to enlist them into uh, extreme violence that as we know at the end led to Jews destroying Palestine and erecting a different place. So what I did is uh, inviting 20 or 25 uh, Jews and Arabs, second or third generations of, uh, 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 let's say, to simplify the story, victims and perpetrators uh, in this place, uh, who read uh, in Hebrew and Arabic alternately. 
uh, <clears throat> some of these contracts. And as you will see, the contracts can be very banal, very, you know, you stole from us three pigs, uh, we have a new vet in our village, if you will bring back the pigs, we will give you services of the vet for free. And this is, for me, became not only the origin of this film, that I'll screen four minutes of it, but the origin of my uh, reconceptualization, again, as a political theorist, if I can wear this hat, uh, if I can wear this hat because I don't like, you know, this kind of field of expertise, but nonetheless, I'm trying to intervene in this field. This led me to reconceptualize sovereignty rather than top down as what I call worldly sovereignty, as the way that people are taking care of their shared world. And one more thing that I would like to say about this, there is uh, uh, one of the massacres, of the many massacres that the Jews uh, uh, carried on in Palestine as part of the expulsion and of Palestinians and the destruction of Palestine. Uh, uh, one of them is somehow became more famous than the others, uh, the massacre of Dir Yassin. And I remember I read the whole idea to look for these documents started when one of the historians that is really the archetype of the historians that I, I see as the criminal of the discipline, uh, wrote one line of this uh, about this document, uh, that there was, a, there was a kind of uh, good relationship uh, agreement in Dear Yassin. And I remember that I struggled for a while to understand how this uh, uh, contract was uh, violated because I know that it was violated. I know that there was uh, a massacre in Dir Yassin and I read the, the pact that they uh, achieved and it's really very, very detailed in a way that I couldn't imagine that those people would violate the contract. They said, for example, if it will be during the day that the nationalists will come, we will hang three white clothes uh, uh, on a uh, laundry line. If it will be in the evening, we will use a, a flashlight and we will signal three times. So they sat together for a while and they really crafted a very detailed uh, 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 pact. And uh, actually, on the one hand, I knew uh, that uh, the massacre in Dir Yassin was carried on by two guerrilla, two mil uh, Jewish militia. But somehow it took me years, I think, to undo the connection between those who lived there and those who carried on uh, uh, the massacre. So uh, uh, the attempt is of rewinding history, retrieving those potentialities, is not to project on that moment when there were other potentialities uh, 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 out there, not to project on them in retrospect the outcome that we know that the Jews became the master of the land. So trying to uh, be there when it was not clear at all that the Jews will be the victorious with quotation mark side and they will be capable to carry on the destruction of Palestine, the just, uh, uh, I would like to add before I show it, uh, 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 that uh, uh, Palestine was dear to many people who lived there. So this project of destruction, we have to understand it uh, as something that is imposed not only on the population that is being forced to uh, leave the country, but also on those who are becoming complicit with protecting and guarding the new uh, configuration of violence, which is the state of Israel. So maybe I will. בית איקסה. בית איקסה. תושבי בית איקסה התנגדו בתקיפות לכניסה של לוחמים ערביים לכפרם, וסירבו להפוך אותו לבסיס צבאי. חלק מהתושבים נפצע במהלך ההתנגדות. בית ספאפה. בית ספאפה. תווג'ה הסוכן ובטלב מסעדת מן הלג'נת הערבית והלחזב הערבי. פרד הלדי תסלמוה קילה להם أنه ككل قرية قريبة من بلدة يهودية لم تعد القرية تحت سلطة أهلها وإنما في سلطة أبناء الشعب وخيار النزوح عن القرية يتعلق بهم عرض السكان بشدة دخول مقاتلين مسلحين إلى القرية ودفعوا ثمن ذلك حياتهم وهدم عدد من منازلهم 
נהריה תרשיחא. נהריה תרשיחא. בפגישה הראשונה לשיפור יחסי שכנות בין יהודים לערבים, הודגשו היחסים הטובים ביניהם. דוקטור הירש הציע שרופאים יקבלו חולים עניים מהכפרים הסמוכים ללא תשלום, והווטרינר הציע לתת הרצאות ולהדריך בעלי בקר כיצד להילחם במחלות. ראש מועצת תרשיחא הזמין את המשתתפים לארוחת צהריים. בית ג'יברין. בית ג'יברין. في مسجد في وادي حنين وأمام خمسمائة شخص خطب الشيخ عبد الرحمن بمناسبة عيد المولد النبوي وأيد في خطبته التعاون العربي اليهودية لمحاربة العدو المشترك السلطة البريطانية جوادعة ودي عارة ودي عارة 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 معيان عيرون معيان عيرون كفار بينس كفار بينس مش مروت مش مروت جان هاشمرون جان هاشمرون يهفوت حبيبة يهفوت حبيبة عين شمر عين شمر نربطة نربطة تم في اللقاء التأكيد على أهمية المجالس المشتركة بعد صدمات في أفريقيا. أحد من المتحدثين قال علينا كجزء من العالم العربي أن نعيش معكم أيضا. التاريخ العربي مليء بالأمثلة على الجرائم. وأضاف آخر نعيش على أرض واحدة والواقع هو الذي يحدد لنا. أن نجد طريقة للعيش معا مودوس فيفندي انتهى اللقاء الاتفاق على عكامة لجنة المشتركة لجنة الوسطاء لمعنى الابتزازات بحسون عنيانين بدر كيشنو So maybe just to come back to your question, it's to position ourselves as, in, uh, as if we can claim the promises that were broken, uh, to position ourselves as you know, the uh, descendants of people who gave promises to each other and to bypass the imperial violence of the creation of the State of Israel at the expenses of the destroyed Palestine. Thank you. So I think there's a microphone in the audience. Does anybody have a question? Oh, there's two, in fact, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Just to warm up with the conversation, perhaps. Um, thank you both. And Stanley, thank you very much for reading Agha Shahid Ali's book. I read it many times before, but in this context and in this moment, it did a certain kind of work, uh, which was, I think, very powerful and beautiful in relation to um, the way in which Ariana, you were drawing out not just from your book, but also the other ways in which you uh, bring together the argument, the images, of course, having had some of that before. It was nice. It was not just nice, but it was actually very hard to have you in, in conversation here and also to be engaged by the team uh, for this conversation. Um, I suppose anticipating uh, conversations that, we, that are yet to come, um, as someone who is in disciplinary history, uh, to think about this um, implication of history, I mean, in, in a sense, for many of us who have always had to work in, in the archives, in, uh, I think with the violence, history was never outside of it, just as 
almost all the disciplines. Um, I can't think of uh, any that uh, in, the, in the academy that is not made outside of um, imperial violence. Um, and so in having to sort of think about, you know, which discipline one might end up with, if, yeah, I mean, what to, if one was to think with what that means, what the practice of a discipline is, in what that enables and what what one must do against it, no matter which discipline, be it at, as a photographer or an archaeologist or an architect, uh, in a way you, you constantly take some practices and have to work against it at the same time. The special um, uh, the special place perhaps history has here is um, in relation to archive. And I would wonder um, in many ways, what you're asking for is the undoing of um, traditional historical practice, because uh, uh, there have, yeah, there have been many different ways of thinking about, or, or from the very beginning, a writing against those practices was always part of having to counter imperial violence. Um, just when I come back to thinking about the specificity of uh, the practice of history here, um, is it in relation to archive? Because the archive, in a way, is organizing the political, the social, um, as much as it is um, a question of the present. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go quickly because I'm 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 here to hear Ariella. I mean, I, you know, I I've been very interested in my own practice of making lately, and also in some of the writing I've been doing about photography and in how the archive has has sort of resurfaced. And of course, I, to say that it's resurfaced, it never wasn't there. Um, and if you're a photographer and you've done it for a few years, you are an archivist. Everybody has one in the back of their pocket, probably in this room. Um, but but I think uh, you know I. What, what intrigues me, and this is something again that, that comes up in, our, in, in Ariella's book, in fact, I think I can, I can find the exact page. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapped about a thing that she's writing about here. Right? Um, the photograph is evidence for an actual occurrence which the photographic image could never exhaust on its own. This event is an invitation for yet another event, the viewing of the photograph, its reading, taking part in the production of its meaning. The potentiality of future viewings is what makes photography germane to the writing of potential political history. And I think I knew that as a kind of praxis of before I knew it intellectually, um, in the way that we were talking about Tamara having read your book before it had been written, um, which again is part of what makes me such a fan of, of what, what Ariel is clarifying in this book, is that it's already at hand. Um, but yes, the archive, you know, has been and continues to be in, in, in our various interactions with it, the, 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 the mechanism to legitimate uh, the exercise of imperial violence, but it's also simultaneously the mechanism of its undoing in a certain kind of paradoxical way, at least in, in as much as the photograph, precisely because of that event. You know, um, I, can, I can see in 1851 in South Carolina, um, when J.T. Zealy and Louis Agassiz make the portrait of Renty, um, two radically different conceptions of appearance um, and of visibility. Um, and I can imagine the, 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 the complacency with which Agassiz and Zeely will presume that the photograph is going to do the work that they think it should do. The notion that they would have envisaged that it would be such a categorical indictment of them as it is, as an object, I think is Im implausible at best. And that's why I love dealing with Photography, and in particular, why I'm interested in the archive, um, because it's an it's an it's an it's an itinerary of our of our habits of seeing and interacting, um, and it remains perpetually open. And the restaging of it is everything has everything to do with how one can encounter that openness, whether through an interaction with with captions or the refusal of captions, 
you know, whether through a particular kind of arrangement. Um, so for me, I, I, I do think that um, <coughs> the part of the archive that I'm, I'm, I'm con continuously interacting with um, is the photographic one, and, and, and it, has no, it has no stable categories, it has no stable logic. It can be turned against its own kind of coherence. Um, and that can create opportunities for precisely the kind of event of photography that Ariel has been writing about and for, for the social encounter and for the kinds of um, performative practices that can go along with that. Um, and when I'm teaching students about photography, I try to, you know, I, I again, like, hadn't read, um, even, you know, last year, I think it was that you published that series of essays on the, the, the Photo Museum Winter to blog, Still Searching, you know, I. I, that was the first sniff I got of the book that was coming. Um, but I've always been terrified of and wrapped by the, the, the inherent violence of, of, the photo, of the photographic apparatus. And I think I, I'm certainly that's partly because I'm a black man and I've been a black man in a white world most of my life. Um, but it, it's, it's not reducible to just that. Um, description can be a profound act of care um, and redescription can be a profound act of rescue. And so you can't, you can't have the terror without you know, the, the possibility of joy and transcendence, and that's why I think it's worth staying with it. Um, and I don't know if that's still speaking to this sort of question of how one deals with, with imperial violence, and, but I, I think potential, potential history is something that can happen in and through and with the photograph, and, and that's why I want to make a living with it. Yeah. Does that answer your question? So I'll also try to address your question. Um, so uh, it's true that historians, there were always historians who wrote differently about those practices. But what I'm, it's not about, when I'm speaking about the discipline of history and its implication in the reproduction of imperial violence, it's the archive on the one hand, as you mentioned, but it's also um, the way that history is being assumed as an infrastructure for many other disciplines also. We ask our students even, historicize, don't speak like this in the air. Make it accurate, what is accurate? associated to the beginning or the end of the war, associated to this or that event, there is something about the creation of the infrastructure of imperial imagination that historians are being completely uh, are responsible for it and for its reproduction. And I think that it is not about singling out one, two, hundreds of historians who did it differently. Even if they did it differently, they continue to be part of a discipline that should be abolished. So it's really, potential history is about the abolition. It's the abolition of slavery, it's the abolition of history, it's the abolition of the archive, it's the abolition of many things that should be abolished. And in this sense, again, I'm not inventing, I am joining. It's trying to understand abolition, how it comes closer to where am I? And I am political theory, photography, archives, etc. So when you read earlier, Stanley, uh, uh, John Tag, that I'm going very little with him and I'm saying no to the destruction of archives is because one way to uh, describe it is the way that you described why photography, because it has all this, like documents in the archive, has all these, you know, have all these potentialities to read them against or to retrieve from them what nobody meant them to contain for us to read or for others to read. But this doesn't change the need to abolish the regime of the archive, which is the regime that maintain the borders that create the undocumented, that maintain the separation between people and their uh, resources. Or it doesn't mean that uh, the discipline of history should not be abolished because it is because of the discipline of history that uh, Tanahisi codes still need to defend the case for reparations, right? And it is, there are historians who are writing the history of reparations. What do they write when they write the history of reparations? There is a history of reparations and their students maybe will continue if they want to think against the discipline, they will continue to write history of reparations, but reparations will be, will be separated from history. 
There will be a history of reparations. Where, are the, where is the discipline that make of reparations its point of departure? We are living in a world that was devastated, 500 years, and historians write its history rather than using all these counter forces in reality, the counter forces of uh, uh, the general strike, the counter forces in 45 against the implementation of the new world order, the counter forces in 1492 against enslavement, against the witch hunt. Just recall how many witches were tortured to death and they didn't agree to say we are witches, right? Were these forces as part of a discipline that perform abolishment? So in this sense, when I'm speaking, when I'm writing this kind of indictment of uh, history as a discipline, it's not to say that I am the first one who is doing the right thing, not at all. There are many people who are doing the very right things. It's about the disciplines that we are continue to operate. So calling for the abolition of slavery, nobody should take it personally. It's not against specific historians. I have different arguments with historians in the book like I have with others. It's a call, imagine going on strike, photographers. Not because you cannot do things with photography, but somehow in this distorted way that imperialism operate, photographers historically own the right for their photographs. There is something here to be done. They own those rights that were taken against other people. So we, they, can, they have some power to revoke the system of rights. The same historians. Historians were endowed with so many rights till today to determine what was before and what was after, to affirm that this is right history and this is wrong, to affirm that this event started at this date and not at this date. They have so much power. Revoke the rights that are involved in the reproduction of the discipline. And it's true for any other discipline also. And when I said earlier that history provides the infrastructure for many other disciplines, we can say also that photography provides, in a way, some part of some layer of these infrastructures. Many disciplines provide them. And what is interesting is that they provide them as being external experts, which means uh, that people are being invited to make work within the discipline, a little bit against the discipline, rather than understanding that the separation between the disciplines is part of what enabled the reproduction of the uh, distribution of imperial rights, and uh, uh, the fact that the case for reparation is still something to be advocated for with more documents, as if we needed any additional document to understand that what was plundered should be returned, uh, what was taken, what was seized, to use Tamawa Lanier's terminology, should be restituted, uh, 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 what was uh, 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 people whose life was taken from them, their descendants should be uh, 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 compensated for that. So the fact that the case for reparations still require more additional archival documents is part of what should be abolished or part of what we should go on strike for. Maybe we spoke too much and we exhausted everybody. Does that tap out? Okay, thank you everybody so much. Thank you so much, Stanley.